Rejoice and be glad in it. Say in it. This is the day the Lord has made. I am going to rejoice and be glad in it. Notice we put a small amount of emphasis on it. You know why? All the money in the world could not buy back one single second of yesterday. It's gone. It's history. And if you've studied the Bible, the Bible says, boast not yourself of tomorrow. You have no comprehension what one day will bring. So that's why we need to maximize this moment. Live now. The Bible says redeem the time. Make the best use of every opportunity. One translation says snatch up every opportunity. And so we need to redeem the time. One of the ways we do that is to walk with goal, aim, and true purpose. Have you ever found a verse in the Bible you know it's real, but you don't believe the people really grasp it? Here's one. 1 Corinthians 1.26, it says, Brethren, the people of God, you see your calling. Uh, I don't believe they do. I believe very few people actually grasp that they're called of God, and God has a unique, specific call for them. You know, that we need to understand God has a special call for you. I did a teaching once called, called The Calls of God. Every one of us have two major calls. First of all, every human being in the world gets a call from God. Number one, the call to salvation. God would have all men to be saved. The Bible says you're an inexcusable, oh man. Nobody has an excuse for not getting saved. That's what it says. Well, the Bible says we have a witness without and a witness within. So what, the, what we've got to do is realize, yes, God gives every human being on the earth a call to salvation. If you answer that call to salvation, you get a call, number one, to sanctification. After we get saved, God wants us to get sanctified, cleaned up, purified, uh, really. And then he gives us the call of service, doesn't he? The call to enter into his vineyard. Steve, thank you for the, the CD. God bless your heart. You know, that's so generous of you to give it to me. You know, with, you know God loves a cheerful giver without any manipulation or strain at all. Ah, yeah. Once I was in a meeting and we were in some kind of a civic center venue and uh, Paul Keith and uh, some other preachers were there. One was uh, Sean Bolts. And Sean, somebody had given him a whole family size bag of M&M peanuts. So... I'm the preacher that day, and so I walked by, and I saw those M&Ms, a whole family-sized bag of them. I said, I I'm a speaker. <laughs> I didn't get any M&Ms. And, oh, I just, I, I made it so sad, so compelling. Sean got so nervous, he couldn't hardly contain himself. And so finally he says, do you want one? I said, yes, I want one bag. And so I got his, <laughs> I got his whole bag of M&Ms, and while I'm talking, I tore open the corner, just the smallest corner of this bag of M&Ms. And when I did that, I saw colors everywhere. And so I, I said to Paul Keith, Paul Keith, you know blue's the color of Revelation. Here, take this blue one. And I was calling out the color before they shook out. Then I said to him, watch this. You're in a season of doubles. Take this with blue one. And then Wanda, his wife, was sitting there. And I said, Wanda, brown is the color of servanthood. Take this brown one. And I started pitching out the colors. I couldn't have picked them out of a glass bowl as quick. And you understand that? Then I'm walking up and down, throwing people M&Ms, talking about the colors before they show up. And all of a sudden, I thought, who in their right mind is going to prophesy out of an M&M bag? <laughs> but, uh, see, God doesn't matter how you do it, just so you do it. You know what I mean? Plus, the next time I went to a meeting, we had cartons of M&Ms. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Have you ever read? You've read the Bible, hadn't you? Matthew 10, 41. It says, here's what it says. If you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. That's what it says. Okay, let me ask you, what is that? If you're going to receive it, you need to know what you're going to receive. If you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. Now, I want to tell you what it is. When I tell you, you probably won't believe me, but I vow to you it's the truth. What is a prophet's reward? It's found in 2 Kings chapter 4. It's the deepest desire of your heart granted by the power of God. That's what a prophet's reward is. Remember the Shunammite woman? I perceive this is a mighty man of God that continues to pass by our house. Let us build for him a little room. 
I remember one day he stood her at the door and says, should I speak to the king for you? Should I speak to a military commander? She goes, no, I'm fine there. So he says to his servant, Gehazi, what does the girl want? And he said, oh, man, she wants a son. She wants a child. And did she get the deepest desire of her heart? Absolutely. That's the prophet's reward. Yeah. Now, I'll tell you what. Some of you go, well, I don't believe it. Well, you won't see it. There's skepticism ministering to the body of Christ on a very extreme level right now. And here's what they're saying. Don't believe it till you see it. That's right opposite of what Jesus taught. John eleven forty. 40, Jesus said, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see? I'll tell you about doubt. It's deadly. Doubt's a wound that gives birth to unbelief. Don't, 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 don't hang around doubt. Don't hang around skeptic people because it'll rub off on you. It's really true. They'll pull you down. It's true. The Bible says evil companions corrupt your character. We need to be around faith-filled people. People that's going to build us up, use the words to edify and encourage and strengthen. Here's what the Bible said. The Bible says there's those that speak and it's like the slashing of a sword. But there's those that speak and there's medicinal words that they're speaking. It says it's sweet to the mind and healing to the body. You know that, don't you? The scripture says, a, a word that is like apples of gold in settings of silver says it's this. It's sweet to the mind and healing to the body. That's exactly what the Bible says. Isn't that something? I want my words to be that way. I want them to build up, not destroy. Don't you? Say yes. Well, good morning. Everybody sleep well? I have a unique anointing on me right now. I can break a sleep disorder off of any human being. Honest to God, I don't care how long you've had it. I don't care what kind of phobias, what kind of, uh, I don't care what it is. I have an anointing from God on me right now. I can break off any type of sleep disorder off of any human being. And so if you're, if you're suffering through some kind of a sleep disorder, if you'll stand up, we'll pray for you. We have testimony after testimony after testimony of people said, one man said, it's been 40 years since I had a night's sleep without medication. And he said, after that simple prayer, I slept like a baby. So that's good. Now, all of you should be standing because there's some kind of a manipulation, something bad about your sleep. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, I will lay my servants down and their sleep will be sweet. The Bible says, we'll lay down and have no fear because the angels of God will encircle around about us. Lord, I thank you that you want us to learn to sleep and to rest and rejuvenate. You made us that way. So, Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I approach your throne. And I say to the evil demonic forces that harass the people of God, never again. Never again torment their sleep. Never again violate their rest. We say, no, no, you cannot disturb their rest in the name of Jesus. No more nights, terrors, no more visitations of darkness in the night. But Lord, we say to you, we say to you and to your angels, we give you perfect permission to invade our sleep at any time, to speak to us in the night seasons, to stir our soul upon our bed. Lord, we say yes to you, but never again to the dark side. So we speak sweet rest over the people now in Jesus' name. Say, I receive it. I receive it. That's true. Go ahead and be seated. You watch this. You don't have to take Ambien or Lunesta or whatever. Have you ever, have you read the Bible? Man, I'll tell you what, you can't meditate, you can't medicate anxiety, you have to repent of it. Did you know one of the fastest growing businesses in America right now, well, there's two of them that's going off the chart. One is the one dollar demon, the psychics. Second one that's going off the chart in America is pharmaceutical companies. You know what, they're, they're making great wealth off of people's paranoia. You know the little, have you seen the little commercial? The little butterfly, he comes sailing in. And, you know, he'll give you a good night's rest and some other things. Listen to the background music. In the background music, there's somebody talking. It says, there could be some side effects. Loss of life. Insanity. Your left foot might fall off. I mean, listen, listen. They call them complications. I mean, death, that's about as complicated as it's going to get. And you listen to that. There's music playing back there, you know. And, and then, but you're going, my God, i got to get some of that, you know. We've got to understand, appeal's not the answer. A person is. 
Isaiah 26, 3, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. It says, trust in the Lord Jehovah, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting, never failing strength. Aren't you glad he's powerful enough to help you? Yes, there's a verse in the Bible. It's Psalms 121, verse 1. I lift up my eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made the heavens and the earth. Now, isn't that cool? And he never broke a sweat. So he's got power enough to help you. So his power is adequate and his power is available. It's strange to me we run everywhere except him. We, we deploy every means except him. See, he ought to be the first resource, not the last resort. You believe that? Say yes. Janice, you doing well? God bless your heart. Good to see you. So David's doing good? Okay, good. Good to see y'all. Ah, you're painting up a storm. Isn't it something? I did. I really did. Isn't that amazing? I remember that. Well, good. God's reclaiming the arts. He kept coming to me, Jesus did, and he said, I want you to prophesy that I'm bringing a renaissance to the arts. And I'd prophesied in a monotone voice, God said that he's bringing a renaissance to the arts. And so every time I'd get around people, God said, remind them I'm bringing a renaissance to the arts. And I'd go, God said he's bringing a renaissance to the arts. And the Lord said to me, you know why you're not excited about it? I said, no, but I know I'm not excited about it. And then he said, because you don't understand the word renaissance. I thought renaissance was the dusting off of something old and antiquated, but it's the birthing of something bright and brand new. So God's going to birth something bright and brand new with the arch, and I'm excited about that. I like new things, don't you? I like new things. I, I, I don't like mundane, just run-of-the-mill things. I like new things. Things that are challenging, things that, uh, that stir us, things that causes our jaw to drop and we go, my God, did you see that? I tell you, I think we're probably way too familiar with a God we barely know. What do you think? A way too familiar with a God we barely know. How could that pan out? Mark chapter 4 is a story about it. You want to hear about it? Remember there was disciples, followers of Jesus, guys that got very close to the Lord. And it says, they, Jesus said to those guys, get in the boat. We are going to the other side. Remember the story? So they got into the boat. Now, what were the disciples, most of them before they were disciples? Fishermen. Fishermen. Used to wind, used to waves, used to all the kind of turbulence of water. So they get in the boat, and Jesus goes to sleep on a leather pillow. Scriptures tell us. <sighs> He's asleep. And it says a mighty wind arose. A horrible, vicious storm began to blow up on them. And it says this, that these disciples were absolutely terrorized. They were absolutely terrorized because of the wind and the water and the waves and how perilous it was. And they run to Jesus and they start screaming. If you're reading this in the Greek, it is something, man. It's crescendo after crescendo. They run to Jesus and they go, ah, get up. Don't you care? We're all going to drown. He's back there just asleep. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't get up and go, ah? <laughs> no, no he, didn't, he didn't get up and panic. I don't like the King James in this story. The King James says, and Jesus got up and he stood at the bow of the boat and he says, peace be still. It sounds like a poem, peace be still. And if you're reading it in the, the Greek, everybody's just screaming and it's, it's just, you know, pandemonium. And Jesus gets up, no pandemonium, no fear, perfect peace. And he says to that raging demonic storm, he didn't say, peace be still. Guess what he says? Shut up and lay down. That's what he says. That's exactly what he says. He says, get gag and be still. And here's what happened. It said that the storm, the winds go, and there is still and it's tranquil as a piece of glass. Now we look over at the disciples. They're ashen white. They're whole being shaken. And they go, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? See, they were horrified of the storm. Now they're terrified of who's in their boat. <laughs> See, a way too familiar with a God they barely knew. Now, I, I think we could learn some lessons from what brought on their fear. 
I suspect they had no ear to hear the prophetic word. Get in the boat. We are going to the other side. I didn't hear anything in there about drowning, resuscitation, Coast Guard rescue, anything like that. Get in. Number two, they forgot who was in their vessel. Now, you know who's in you? I'll tell you what. The Spirit of the living God is in you. Everything that was in Jesus is in you. Have you ever found a verse that if it wasn't in the Bible, you would have nothing to do with it? Here's one, Colossians 2, 9. It pleased the Father that the fullness of deity would dwell in Jesus bodily. Oh, you say, Bobby, that's not hard for me to believe. It pleased the Father that the fullness of deity would dwell in Jesus bodily. Oh, that's not the one we have trouble with. It's the next verse, verse 10, Colossians 2, 10. It says, basically, all that God is, is in Christ. And then all that Christ is, is in you. That's the one we have trouble with. All that Jesus is, is in you. Or you're not even in this thing called the Christian pursuit. Romans 8, 9 through 11 says, If the Spirit that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead dwell not in you, you are none of His. I think you and I need a new appreciation for Holy Ghost. A deeper uh, receptivity of the Holy Spirit. I can prove to you there's not one single miracle in the New Testament Jesus did till He was filled with the Holy Ghost. Not a single one. He did get filled in Acts 10, 38. What does it say? It said God did something. He anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. You'll never divorce those two, Holy Ghost and power. Every time in Scripture you find Holy Ghost, look, you'll see power. Most people think the Holy Ghost shows up in Acts 2, 1. Holy Ghost shows up in Genesis 1, 2. Spirit of God moving, brooding, breathing. We need a new appreciation for Holy Ghost. He's the only God agent on this planet. God the Father is where? Heaven. God the Son seated at His right hand. Guess who's down here? God the Holy Spirit. Ah, he's more than a parakeet and a pigeon. Oh, oh. He's the power agent of God. That's right. Romans 8. 14 through 16 says, His Spirit will communicate and bear witness with our spirit that we are a child of God. I think it's going to be sad. A lot of people in church are not even saved. Oh, they've been Christian, sprinkled, confirmed, gone through some ritual. All oh, that's okay, but none of that's being born of the Spirit. Jesus told Nick, you must be born again. Hey, I was giving an interview to a magazine and this woman says, the, the lady that was interviewing with a snarl in her lip and hostility in her voice, she goes, oh, oh, so you're one of those born-again Christians. I said to her, oh, is there any other kind? <laughs> See, there's not a Christian than a born-again Christian. Only way you become a Christian is you must be born again. There's some crazy stuff out there now about salvation. We better hang on to Acts 4.12. Acts 4 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name given among men whereby you must be saved. Jesus said in John 14 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No person is going to come to God except by me. But th there's this, this stuff going on out there. Well, we need to be flexible, we need to be tolerable of what others believe. You know, after all, no, listen, we cannot let people go to hell comfortably. We need to trouble those that are on the road to hell. Warn them. The Bible said if I command you to warn the wicked of his wicked way and you don't warn him, his blood will I require at your hands. Well, you know, I want to be politically correct. That's a trap. Trying to be politically correct is a trap. The Bible said it this way. If I attempt to please men, I will not please God that called me. Galatians 1, 6. We got to realize we better fear him more than fearing men. It's true. I tell the church, you can't survive misdiagnosis any longer. What is misdiagnosis? I tell people, if you go to the doctor with a broke arm, he says, your ears are right, get another doctor. Get somebody that will tell you the truth. There's some crazy things out there concerning the, the, the wrath of God. There's people going, oh, you know, God's a God of love. Yes, he is. 
Lamentation 3, 20 and 21 says his mercies are new every day. That's the reason we're not consumed. But I want to tell you there's another side to God. You know, this thing, all the judgments were over at the cross. Somebody forgot to send Ananias and Sapphira the memo. Wow. Suggest. I think Acts is after the cross. They dropped dead in the house of God over deception concerning devotion to God. See? Well, I don't believe God will judge people. You better read the Bible. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. That's right. You just wait and see. There's another side to God. I tell these guys preaching that kind of stuff, if you just got a two-headed two coin, every time it comes up, it comes up, mercy, mercy. You've got something God does not put spiritual currency on. A two-headed coin is a counterfeit. Listen to me now. See, somebody's got to tell us the truth about it. Well, you know, I didn't know God was going to judge me. Hey, I'll tell you, the only way you really know you're saved is that God judges you. I've studied this Bible a long time. I've been preaching 44 years, average speaking five times a week for 44 years. Average speaking five times a week for 44 years. Here's the, here's the quickest way and the most sure way I know that you're a born-again believer. Not gifts. I'll tell you, the surest way you know you're a born-again believer is God chastens you and corrects you when you do wrong. The Bible said if any person be without that, they're illegitimate have no birth papers. If you can habitually sin and get away with it, check it out. Check it out. Something is wrong. Yeah. If you be without chastisement. Well, well. Let's talk about this misdiagnosis. Y'all remember the church of Laodicea in Revelations? Laodicea. The word Laodicea is a Greek, a Greek word that means governed by the group. So we're looking at a people-run church controlled by the people. And they analyze themselves according to Revelation here. And it says, we're rich and increased in goods and we don't have need of nothing. Wow. Satisfied, smug, can you feel that? And Jesus said, strange. When I looked at you, I saw you naked, wretched, miserable, poor, and blind. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems like there's a gap in opinions. <laughs> Correct? Rich and trace of goods have need of nothing. Naked, wretched, and miserable, poor, and blind. Now, somebody's right and somebody's wrong. I'm leaning towards Jesus, aren't you? See, he'll tell us the truth. He'll tell us the truth. You'll know the truth. The truth will emancipate you. It says, whom the Son sets free, free indeed. I looked up the word indeed. It's a courtroom term. It means irrevocable. Unrescindable. Isn't that something? Free. i tell you, freedom's good. But I'll tell you about Jesus. He never points out our plight, our problem, without quickly showing us an answer. In that revelation, talking about Laodicea, he says, next verse is, my advice to you is to come to me. Buy from me gold tried in the fire. Buy from me white raiment to cover your nakedness. Buy from me eyes salve that you may see. See, everything we have need of, he has ample supply. If we're willing to pay the price. You believe that? Well, everybody okay this morning? Well, as far as you know. That's true. It's hard to believe that we're in such a dilemma in our nation. And most people don't even know it. Somebody better sound the alarm. Now, if you think somebody's going to ride in on a white horse, so to speak, and pull us up by the bootstraps, I tell you what, I get to go to these think tanks all over the world where they analyze current situations. And here's, here's what I told them the last one I went to. See if you agree with me. We're beyond human help. I'll guarantee you we're beyond human help. I'll tell you where we are if you want to know. 2 Chronicles 20, 12. 2 Chronicles 20, 12 says, Neither know we what to do against this great multitude that's come up against us, but our eyes are upon you. And King Jehoshaphat does something. He calls a fast. He calls a prayer meeting. He brings the women, the warriors, the teenagers, 
the little ones. And it says, even those that suck the breast, because he's wise enough to know what they're facing is going to affect every generation. Neither know we what to do against this great multitude that's come up against us, but our eyes are upon you. And it says, he called a fast. And as they earnestly set themselves to seek the Lord, then, say then, then, then the Spirit of God fell upon the prophet. And the prophet says, listen to me. All of you Judeans, all of you from the city of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat. And then he began to give them the strategy from heaven to defeat an undefeatable foe. You know what I would have said? Because here's what he said to them. You will not need to go out and face them with the warriors. Send out the singers. I'd have said second opinion. See, they'd never been in human history a war fought like that. See, but God likes to do new things. He'll get us up into a corner to show us new things. I don't believe that. Well, you've never read the Bible very deep. I'll guarantee you 1,000% God will start a storm that's big enough, bad enough to blow away every bit of your confidence in your own ability. Well, uh, I just thought he was good. No, no. He loves you too much to let you be lackadaisical. He'll push us. See, I've been preaching 44 years, five times a week. I've learned something about God. He's good at coercing. He can get you in a hammerlock if he has to. Look at Jonah. Go this way. I'm going that way. Three days later, he goes, whoa, Nineveh, that's a place to hang. Listen, God can tweak you, can't he? You ever been tweaked by the Lord? Oh, man, it's a wonderful testing when God teaches us by his spirit. But anyway... Let me just clarify that with some verses, okay, about God starting storms. Have you read the Bible? Here, here's your story, Josh. Here's your story. Psalms 107, verse 23. It says, these that do business in great waters, talking about sailors, can't you, I want you to see them in their mind. They're not little limp wrist, uh, you know, kind of uh, fluffy type, type men. I can see them, their, skins, their skin is weathered. Their hair is bleached by the sun and the wind. There's biceps and they're strong and they're, they're just rough, rough sailors. Psalms 107, verse 23. These that do business in great waters, that go down to the sea in ships, they see the works of the Lord because He raises up the stormy winds. Says they, these seasoned sailors, they the ship goes as high as the heavens, it drops down to the low depths, and it says these sailors are staggering to and fro. They are like drunken men. The next verse is paramount. It says, They are at their wits' end. What does that mean? It means they deployed every bit of their ability to rectify the problem they've done everything within their power to solve the situation they've they've expended every bit of their energy they're at their wits end next verse says t-h-e-n t-h-e-n then then they cried to the lord in their trouble and he hears them and brings them out of all of their distresses oh that men would praise God for his goodness. I'll guarantee you God will start a storm. How big will it get? However big it takes to blow away your confidence in your own ability. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that continues to proceed from the mouth of God. It is not by might, nor by human power, but by my spirit, declares the Lord. See, so we're beyond human help. I think one of our problems was we thought God would straighten this mess out at the White House instead of the church house. That's our problem. That's our problem. Yes, sir. Got some stuff up here. Got some stuff. Steve's gone. I ought to get up here and play with this stuff. Man. I don't know what this thing does. It was playing a violin earlier. He, he knows enough to turn it off when I'm here. <laughs> See, I don't know enough to turn it off. And let's talk about this tweeting. My grandson, he's 18, and he said to me the other day with a, he said, you're not still emailing, are you? 
just learned how, and it's archaic. You're not still emailing, are you? I go, yeah. <laughs> See, and then they said to me, do you tweet? I go, well, I might have. <laughs> hey, you know. I wasn't sure about this tweeting, and so that was educational for me. I've never tweeted a tweet, but I want to tweet some. If Patricia can tweet, I can tweet. But of course, she's got these young kids around her that go, well, it's like this. Man, in Texas, we're afraid we'll launch the shuttle or something, you know. Don't do that, you know. We race some kind of world-famous stuff, you know. Yeah, kids, they're not afraid. They're not afraid of computers, are they? You know, I got a little grandson, he's five. He says, bring your iPad back where I can play Jetpack or whatever. <laughs> Isn't that something? Well, nobody my age can set a VCR. They're going 12, 12, you know it. <laughs> yeah. We're waiting on the grandkids to come fix it for us. <laughs> That's true. Well, anyway, computers. Kid, well, anyway, the Bible says in the end time, knowledge will accelerate. Yeah. Isn't that something? I got a verse for you if you want it. You want it? He said, I'll give the people Isaiah 50, verse 4, the tongue of a taught one that they'll know how to respond to the people that are saying, how do we make it through this dangerous, dark days? The tongue of a taught one. Yes, you'll know how to reply to those that ask you, how do we make it through this weary walk? You want that? Yes. You can receive it. You can receive it. He'll give you the tongue of a taught one. Say, I receive it. Yes. So when your friends ask you for advice, it'll be him speaking, not you. It's true. Yep. I want that, don't you? I gave you a verse last night, James 1, 5. If any of us are deficient in wisdom, let him ask God the giving God. He'll give it to us lavishly is what it says. One time the Lord asked me, he said, if you had one word to describe me, what word would you use? And that was the word I used, lavish. Everything he does, he does over the top. Everything he does, he does bigger, wider, more expandable than we could ever imagine. My grandson, when he was eight, my oldest grandson, when he was eight, I said to him, I said, hey, Blake, his name's Blake. Apparently, or I wouldn't have called him that. I said, hey, Blake, if you had one word to say of the whole body of Christ, the whole body of Christ around the world. This is 10 years ago now. I said, what would you say? So he's thinking, one word to say of the whole body of Christ around the whole world. And then he stunned me. Here's what he said, eight years old. He said, well, Papa, I'll preach. I'd say the word threshold. Threshold. So I said to him, threshold? Why would you say threshold? And he got this kind of impatient look on his face. He goes, the church is at the door. They can enter in or back away. Wow. That was 10 years ago. Isn't that something? Threshold. I thought, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> During that same period of time, I'd written a little bitty pamphlet on the coming apostolic wave. Because, you know, this is 10 years ago. You could feel the momentum of the apostolic movement building. So I, I wanted to write this little pamphlet, this little book on the coming apostolic wave. So to show you what level I'm writing at, I gave it to my grandson, eight, eight years old. I said, Blake, read this. See what you think. I'm off in a revival meeting in a meeting somewhere. He calls me. He said, Papa, I'll preach. I don't think that's a good title. The coming apostolic wave. And so now I'm a little bit offended. I said, okay, what would you name it? He said, I would call it the approaching apostolic authority. I said, approaching? He goes, ah, something that's coming but is not here yet. <laughs> See, the whole book was we're attempting to paint a full portrait from only a sonogram trying to predefine something that God is only now emerging. I'll tell you what that'll do. It'll set back the move of God 40 years, just like that. Yes, trying to see the devil, if he can't stop a coming move, he'll push it out prematurely. Example, Moses. 
Remember that? God called him to be a deliverer, so he jumped up and tried to do it in his own power. Killed the Egyptian, remember that? What did it do? Did it advance the kingdom? It delayed the kingdom for 40 years. Backside of the desert. Well, anyway, y'all are working on it. There's a stone. Is that the Revelation 2.17? That may be the Revelation 2.17 stone. Have you read that? To him that overcomes, I will grant to eat the hidden man, and I'll give you a white stone. And on the white stone will be written a name that only you will know. I like that, don't you? I like mysteries. You like mysteries? Well, I was going to teach on something. Oh, I forgot. When you're ready to start preaching, cue the sound man. <laughs> okay. Remember yesterday I talked to you about uh, light. Let there be light. Say, let there be light. That's good. And then here's what it says. Well, let me find the right clicker. Boy, we could watch the news. Yeah. Here's the verse, Genesis 1, 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Then I want to show you what he does with that light. Genesis chapter 1, verse 4. And God saw that the light was good and suitable and pleasant, and he approved it. And God separated the light from the darkness. I want that phrase to get into you. God separated, put a distance, put a, a difference between light and darkness. He said the light's good. But then he says he approved of the light and he separated the light from the darkness. You believe he's still doing that? Yes. Here's, a, here's a verse for you. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is written by Solomon. When Solomon was under the wisdom of God. Listen to what it says. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 13. Then I saw that even human wisdom that brings sorrow is better than the pleasures of folly as far as light is much better than darkness. Say it, light, light. is much better than darkness. Than Say it again, light, light is much better than darkness. We're to have no dealings with the unfruitful works of darkness. So here's one, Proverbs 20, verse 27. I like this one. This makes me think of Patricia. Proverbs 20, verse 27. The human spirit is the lamp of the Lord that shines light on one's innermost being. Read that again. Proverbs 20, 27. The human spirit is the lamp of the Lord that shines light on one's inner being, your soul, your spirit. I want my lamp to be alighted, don't you? I want his flame upon my heart. I want his light in my life, don't you? So I want that. I want his fire upon my human spirit, don't you? I quoted you the verse last, last night. Ezekiel 36, 26. Extract from us a hard, calloused heart. Re re replace it with a soft, teachable heart. Com compliable heart, one that'll listen to you, talk with you, fellowship with you, one that can follow your commandments. The Bible said the commandments are the lamp of the Lord. That's what it says. But you, you, can, you can study that verse. Here's one. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Jesus talking. Oh boy, I hope we'll believe what he says about us. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, its strength, its quality, how can it be salt? How can the saltlessness be restored? It said once it's lost its ability, it's worthless. But to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. Boy, I don't want to be a good for nothing believer. Do you? I don't want the world just to use this as a, a, a road paving. Verse fourteen. You. Are the light of the city, a city set on a hill which cannot and will not be hidden. Verse 15. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but they light a lamp and put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. See, you may be the only light shining in your house. You believe that? Your children may be lost, your husband may be wicked and wayward, but you're a light. See, I'm telling you, shine in your house. I tell you what the Lord's doing. He's, he's releasing a spirit of evangelism on the earth right now. Your whole family can get saved just like that. 
I don't care how hard, brittle, hateful they've been. God says love is the key that will unlock the hardest heart. So he's releasing a baptism of love towards those that are steadfastly shining their light. So it says, you are the, the nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but they put it on a lampstand so it'll give light to all the ha- in the house. Verse 16, this is Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good moral excellence and your praiseworthy, noble, good deeds and recognize and honor and praise and glorify your Father who dwells in heaven. You need to be, li- I need to be living such a life, people go, woo, there's a good example of who God is. That's what I want to be like, don't you? That's what it says. Matthew 6, 22 through 23. Now, here's one. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is sound, your entire body would be filled with good light. Your eye is a gateway into your body. And the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is sound, Solid, sure, your entire body will be full of light. But if your eye is unsound, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the very light in your conscience be darkened, how dense and deep and drastic is that darkness. I suspect you and I need to guard two gates, this one and this one. What goes in here, what goes in here ends up here. As a man thinks, that's how he's going to respond. I don't want an eye that beholds iniquity. I don't want my eye gate to be open to drink in. The Bible says, I cho- I've chosen not to set any wicked thing before my face. You go, well, I'm a consenting adult. Listen, don't give me that. Listen, we should have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. The Bible says resist the devil and he flees. Patricia's got this thing in her now about lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. We we need to pray that. I know know some believers that seem like they want to see how close they can walk to the edge. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. Okay. Another verse. Matthew 17, 1 through 3. I like this one. It says, after several days, Jesus takes with him his inner core up into the mountains. I'll just read it for you. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up into a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them and talked with them. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Woohoo! This is a good place for us. If you want me to, let's build us three tabernacles. Verse 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. Wow. I don't know about you, but I like that kind of stuff. Just a little mountain trek. Come on. Come follow me. I'm going somewhere. Well, I had the fishing trip planned, or it's a good day for golfing. Or, you know, we're going to the mall shop. No, follow him. Pursue him. Long after him. Psalms, 30, Psalms 27 says, When you said, Seek my face, my face cried out, Oh God, your face I'm going to seek. This is the time you'll find him if you seek. Well, we got to get ready. They're preparing lunch. Some chicken. It's a foul thing. Chicken. Chicken. I know. Well, let me finish this. This cloud. Oh, some of the deepest experiences I've ever had started with just a little speck. But you pursue 
the source. What if John would have been on the Isle of Patmos and go, huh, thought I heard something back there, but I'm too busy, you know. After all, I'm a slave and I'm 90 years old. But see, he heard something that stirred deep within him. Psalms 42 says deep is urging, beckoning, calling, alluring deep. So he turned to see the source. What about Moses tripping through the backside of the desert? He said, wow, that's something different. A bush on fire and not being consumed. Never seen that before. No, it says when he turned aside to see, then the Lord spoke. Well, anyway, if you'll follow him, you'll get to see these kind of experiences. I'll tell you, there's a real lesson there. Right in the middle of this great visitation, Pete jumps up with a fleshly idea. Let's do something that'll benefit me. And while he was yet coming up with this strategy, heaven said, shh, listen to what he's got to say. See, we have no strategies till we listen to what he has to say. No real plans that work out till we listen to what he has to say. Anyway, well, let's see if there's another one. Okay, well, apparently not. Well, yes, there is. Okay. Here's one, John 1, 1 through 9. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines into the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. That all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Verse 9. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. And the word man means every person coming into the world. Something will change about your attitude of global evangelism if you believe that one verse. You do like John. Build a platform for Jesus to stand on. He's the light that will light the pathway of every person in the whole world. That's what it says. That was the true light which gives light to every, say every, every person coming into the world. Well, I've been taught, I know some Muslims that Jesus appeared to. I mean, and here's what happened. This Muslim I know was sick and Jesus Christ came into his room and appeared to him and he said, I'm Jesus Christ, the son of God. I'm here to heal you. He said, I'm a Muslim. I don't believe God had a son. And Jesus said, I'm the son of God. My name is Jesus. I'm here to heal you. The Muslim said again, I'm a Muslim. I don't believe God had a son. Jesus said, I'm the son of God. I'm here to heal you. And and Jesus healed him even in the midst of him saying, I don't believe God had a son. But now he believes God has a son. He goes all over the world and preaches about this son because this is the light that leads all men that comes into the world. Isn't that true? He goes all over the world now preaching. They tried to kill him, put their assassination squads loose, but he just won all of his brothers to Jesus. Well, anyway, I I underline that one. That was the true light. This is the true light. What gives light to every person coming into the world. John 8, 12, then Jesus spoke to them and saying again, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Well, there's a bunch more, but we got to go. Adios. Yeah, had, we had breakfast together. Good. Boy, I tell you what. I'm interested. You talked about somebody that you know that's into micro uh, organisms and stuff like that. The Lord spoke to me about it. And, uh, and so that was pretty neat. We're going to learn big lessons from little things. That's what I wrote. Then I also wrote, watch out. Oh, well, <laughs> look out. Ponder deep space. So you write the shepherd's rod a year before it happens. So I said, watch deep space. Did they find anything in deep space? Google it when you get back to your room. They've discovered another place.
planet just like this one, and they call it Big Earth from distant deep space. Then I also said, this will be the year we see meteor showers like we've never seen in our life. Google that. Well, anyway, get the shepherd's rod. Get Patricia's decree book. I like that. We go, oh, I wish God knew something. He said, I wish you'd say something. We have not because we ask not. He says, concerning the works of my hands, command ye thou me. Wow, get your heart full of the word of God. When you open your mouth, you're praying back to God his promise. It's true. I found out about God. You can bug him and get more out of him than he intended to give you. It's true. That's true in the Bible. Well, anyway, where do you live at? Right here? Well, that's good. What do you do? Are you good? I see light. I see light going. I see like a weaver shuttle over your head. I see a, a, a light like a weaver shuttle going over your head. I think he's making a tapestry. That's right. Well, that was good. Well, to me, it was good. I enjoyed it. That's good. Yeah. How's your ankle? Got them green shoes on, man. That's styling. Yeah. Yeah. They don't make them boots, do they? Cowboy boots. No. Oh, doggone. I got a friend, his name's Chester Kennedy. He and I grew up, went to school together, graduated and all that, and he's got a big old red beard down to his belly button. Well, it's gray now, but he used to, uh, when we rode motorcycles, he'd pull he had him tie it in a knot. I'll tell you what happened to old Chester. He bought him an automated pea sheller, and last summer he was shelling peas with his automatic pea sheller and got his beard caught in the pea sheller. And his wife was riding the lawnmower, cutting the grass, and Chester couldn't get the off and on switch, and this pea sheller's eating him into it. I said, now you might be a redneck if you get your beard caught in a pea sheller. You know, there's a good chance of that. Yeah, Chester. I tell you about him. We were growing up and we, uh, we got in a knife fight and the guy cut his nose off. <laughs> Trying to cut his throat. All of this falls down. <laughs> oh man, they, we didn't know nothing. There was no plastic surgeon. And, but we carried him to a little hick town and just a plain old ordinary doctor jerked it up and sewed it back together. And you can barely see a little blue scar. Isn't that something? Ah, oh, Chester. He always says, a Ford man. I was a Chevrolet guy. Good Lord, we'd have some races you couldn't believe, man. Whew. Yeah, I had a car. Well, I better not talk. Yes, I had a car. <laughs> I had a '57 Chevrolet with a '283 bored out to a '301, and I had full race cam in it and two four-barrel carburetors. I could pull up beside the policeman and blow at him and take off. Yeah, just out. I got stopped 16 times one day. Yeah, that's true. That was my Chevrolet. Yeah. When I surrendered to preach, I had the fastest car money would buy off the showroom floor. I had a 68 GTO, had two four barrels on it from the factory. Yeah, of course, gas was 25 cents a gallon. Yeah. That thing would be worth a ton of money right now. First time my wife ever saw me, I shaved every hair on my head with a razor, and I'd put Vaseline on it so it would shine, and I was riding a motorcycle down a snow-covered road, an Indian motorcycle. Well, if I still had that, that would be worth something. Last motorcycle I got on, my wife said, Bobby, please don't ride motorcycles. So I said to her, I'll try not to. That was my answer. This guy comes up on a Ninja. Y'all know what a Ninja is? It's 1,100 cc. It'll run 128 miles an hour in six seconds, faster than an Indy car. <laughs> he pulled in, black visor, black hood, and he said, you want to ride this? I go, yeah. <laughs> Honest to God. So I straddled this thing, 1,100 cc's of grease lightning. So I'm, going, I'm on Texas, I'm on Highway 69, I'm going north, there's two lanes and then there's two lanes over there. Man, listen, why have a bike like that if you're gonna putter? You know what I mean? <laughs> so I ribbed that thing, <laughs> that's me going. <laughs> I'm up to around 120, something like that. And guess who I meet coming down the other side? My wife. <laughs> She goes, that looked like Bobby's clothes. <laughs> yep, that's true. I get back to where I was, and boy, I'm, I'm puttering in. 
There she is patting her foot. And she said, you told me you'd not ride motorcycles. I said, nope, told you I'd try not to. <laughs> but do you like motorcycles? Oh, man, I do. I'm expecting, well, anyway. Okay. I've always liked speed. Why walk if you can skip? You know what I mean? There's no sense being bored. I'm tired of people dragging through life going, this all there is. Start living with expectation. Start living with a happy heart. Doctors tell us that if you have a merry heart, you can expect to live 35% longer. One study says if you laugh, you can expect to live eight years longer. Jesus said it this way, a merry heart. The scripture said a merry heart does good like a medicine. Well, we've got to get out of here. Yep. That's right. You're wondering what I saw. You mean me tell you? I saw a big old sword. He wants to give you a sword. He's going to sheath a sword on your side. That's true. Because he wants you to be a warrior. A walking warrior. Okay. Oh, good. We've got to go now. Chicken's ready. Oh. Did I tell y'all when I killed Granny's chicken? Do y'all okay. remember corn cobs? Listen, Aussies, they got what? What do you call them? Boomerangs? Texas, we had corn cobs. That's true. My grandmother would feed her chicken with corn on the cobs. And she'd shell the corn. And then, I don't know how y'all did it, but there was a, a, about a four and a half gallon bucket there. And she'd take the cobs, drop the cobs in this bucket, and then they would soak them in kerosene a flammable thing so you could start your fire in the wood stove, start your... So anyway, have you ever picked up a soggy corn cob? Oh, there's something about it. I mean, listen, it, it, it speaks to you. Here's what it says. Throw me! So honest to God, here I am. We're out there at Granny's house. Oh, Granny, bless her heart. She dipped snuff. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that's good. But anyway, she's had a yard full of chicken. So I'm out there one day and I had me a corn cob. You could chunk them and go, and they go, and those chickens, they were tempting me. They'd run out there about 40 yards. So I said to myself, you know, I bet if I chunked about this far in front of that running chicken, and I'll tell you, I let her rip. And there was a connection. Right here on the chicken's head. Yeah, I mean, listen, it flopped. It quivered. Feathers everywhere. And I walk up there. Have you ever seen? There's the chicken. Limp, dead. I thought, my God, I've killed Granny's chicken. So I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hide the evidence. <laughs> this is true, absolute truth. So I took the old dead chicken. I walked up to the fence row. You ever been there? It's about 60 yards up above my grandmother's house. It's where two pieces of land joined, and there's leaves everywhere. That's me kicking out a shallow grave. I buried him, <laughs> covered him up. So now here I'm going back down to face Granny. Now, let me tell you about Granny. You could lie to the teachers. You could lie to the police. You could lie to, you can't lie to Granny. She never watched a Dr. Field program, but she's sharper than a tack, man. So here I come in. Granny's over there at the sink washing dishes. That's me opening Granny's screen door. Some people have burglar alarms. Let's just get you a squeaking door. That's me coming in Granny's back door. So I'm going to try to act like nothing's happened. And as I'm going through the kitchen, Granny wheels around and goes, What's wrong, boy? I mean, just in quiz, what's wrong, boy? I just spilled my guts. I mean, I just spilled, Granny, I didn't need it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story till tonight. true that's true well anyway god bless your heart 
granny. She was, her, she was old and blind in a nursing home. And every time I'd go see her, she'd pray. She'd say, Bobby, before we leave, let's pray to see Clyde. For, I want to see Clyde saved. As one of her sons, he was 72 years old. Hardest human being I've ever encountered in my life. You could not believe the hostility in his heart. And my grandmother would pray, oh, Lord, let me live to see Clyde saved. I thought, oh, I don't know if that will ever happen. Then one day, the preacher from that city called me and he said, Bobby, could you come? I said, what is it? He said, Clyde's under conviction. Walked into place and there my uncle gave his heart publicly to Jesus. I'm telling you the most amazing thing. I go to my grandmother's nursing home room, pull the door open. There she's laying in bed. She's blind. Her little head's on a pillow. And she said she just broke into a beautiful smile and said, Clyde got saved, didn't he? She said, yep. Whew. Clyde went to see his blind daughter in Dumas, Texas, and got a little headache and fell over with a brain aneurysm dead. But he gave his heart to Jesus. Because a little grandmother laying in a bed realized she couldn't talk to him about God, but she could talk to God about him. Lord, you are the light of the world, and you've chosen us to shine through. Lord, remove anything that tints the, the radiance, Lord. Remove anything that smurs your image and smears your image. Lord, give us real, real clean lives that we reflect you like you are. King Jesus, shine bright. You said you're the light that leads all men that come in this world. So shine through your people in Jesus' name. Well, Patricia, God bless you. I'll finish the chicken story later. That was really brutal, actually. Uh, just before we eat chicken for lunch. <laughs> A poor little guy, you know. <laughs> but anyways, um, just before uh, we dismiss, we're going to um, uh, be serving lunch at 1230. So you have time to go pick up your... Uh, tickets for the buffet, you have time to shop and everything. But um, as Bobby was sharing, I was just reminded of, of um, an angel that had visited a number of years ago, and it was when he was talking a few moments ago about acceleration. And um, we were up in Canada at the time, we had had a speaker come in from uh, uh, Europe to teach us about the ministry of angels. And the night before we started that event, I was hosting some friends in our home that were staying over for the conference. And we were in the living room and I saw with an open vision this brown eagle fly through my living room into our kitchen. And it had gold tips on its uh, wings and, and on its neck. And, and uh, I said, wow, did anyone see that? You know, because I, I could even feel the wind of it. No one else saw it. I don't understand that sometimes when things seem so, so real. But anyways, I thought, oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like it. It was Brown Eagle. The next day we went to the event on angels and their assignments, I think it was called. And uh, Michael Schiffman from Germany was teaching about the angelic realm. And um, during one of the um, prayer times, that angel appeared again. And it, it, it just came right into the room. And then I went into a trance vision where I was actually riding that eagle. And I was going all through the nations. And I was seeing from a uh, higher perspective than I'd ever seen before. But it was very quick. It was going through nations very, very quickly. And then I came back out of the trance, and I thought, wow, what was that? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, that is an angel, and it's called Swift. And um, so after the seminar um, the, the next day, um, I went into my house, and, and we had basement stairs going down into the basement, and there was brown feathers, natural feathers, not in a vision like real feathers, brown feathers covered the stairway. And um, I don't know where they came from, I honestly don't, but I felt the Holy Spirit say, this is a confirmation, I'm just, this is a sign. Sometimes the Lord will confirm things with signs following, and I believe it was a sign. And I thought, wow, that angel swift, that, that, that eagle. 
And then I went into my office in the basement and around my chair, in a circle around my chair, were brown feathers. So it was another confirmation. The next day, my husband and I left for a road trip. In fact, I think it was down to Idaho where we were doing a meeting with you. And we were driving and we were, all these trucks with Swift, Swift Transport were passing us. And uh, that is a miracle, I think, because my husband's a very fast driver and <laughs> swift transport isn't known for their swiftness, really. <laughs> but um, anyways, um, they were passing us. And again, the Holy Spirit alerted me. He said, I'm going to accelerate everything. You, you are going into a season of acceleration. I'm sending you this angel who is going to accelerate your mandate, your ministry, and um, everything you do will happen supernaturally fast. And ever since that time, um, it, it's been like as soon as God gives a download, it's like it's implemented. It just, people even ask us all the time, how can you get it done so fast? I mean, James Gall said, I've never seen anyone implement vision as fast. How do you do it? And I said, well, I think it was when Swift showed up, you know, because it, it, it honestly, it honestly has been supernatural. And Bobby was sharing with me about um, an angelic, visitation he had also that was the eagle also and it was opportunity right uh, do you want to share that because what i feel the holy spirit prompting me to do because things are going to be accelerated this year things are really really going to be accelerated for many of you in what god is giving you you're just going to go like you know so um bobby do you want to share about that do you feel led i will um uh, patricia just had told the story about the eagle and uh my wife and I, we live up in Moravian Falls, North Carolina, and we were going up to our home once, and we were going up the driveway, and my wife said, look at that eagle. And I'm looking out the window thinking that it's up in the air, and she said, no, right here. And so help me, there's an eagle, a gold eagle, on the driveway, and when he got up off the driveway, his wings were as wide as one end of our driveway to the other. And it, it didn't just swirl up in the air, it flew up the driveway towards your house, and then went up like this and started circling around. And I said, Lord, what is that? He said, I'm giving golden opportunities. They're, they're, if you stay on the pathway with God, stay on your, your driveway, the highway, and he said, the eagle will meet you there, and it'll be golden opportunities. You believe that? I do, I do. We've got to really understand God is sending us heavenly heifers. And there are ministering spirits sent down to aid us who are heirs of salvation. And so uh, he'll do that for you. Uh, I welcome them, don't you? Lord, we welcome heaven's host. We want the help of heaven. We say, Lord, speak your servants listening. Lord, equip us and qualify us for the task that you've assigned to us. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this. <coughs> Well, I'll tell you what, um, while I was praying, the Lord spoke to me about the service tonight. He wants us to have an impartation service. And I, I'll tell you what, I think one of the things he'll do, he's going to do Romans 1, 11. Paul said, I yearn to be with you that I might impart to you a spiritual enabling that'll equip you to do the task that he's assigned you. Amen. Then he says in verse 12, this is going to be good for both of us. Amen. Yeah. I tell you what the Lord told me. He said, go where I tell you to go. Do what I tell you to do. When you get there, I'll give the people as an impartation, whether they want it or not, Hebrews 13, 20, and 21. That's, boy, that's a verse. It says, the God that brought again from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the everlasting, never-failing covenant, make you perfect. Give you everything you need to accomplish what you're called to do. So I looked at the word perfect. It means missing no component. Well, God bless your heart. Thank you. That's wonderful. You know, um, I just feel like releasing that um, company of angels. I think that God creates them like a company or like types. You know, they're almost like tribes of angels. And I just felt a prompting. And Bobby had shared just the other day about when that angel came, when he saw that angel, that the Lord said, even this year, there's going to be many opportunities. And that came back to me just now. I feel in the spirit that many of you are going to shift, like even maybe before the day's out, that there's going to be opportunities open up to you. And there's going to be opportunities given to you from the Lord, like through revelation. I'm going to share probably tomorrow afternoon at um, from 1.30 till 2.30. I'm going to share about a revelation God gave me just 
a month or two ago that we've been implementing. It's going to be in full force in a couple months. That is going to literally bring in the harvest worldwide in exponential releases. I'm so excited about it. But um, it's going to come like that, like vision or opportunities or doors of opportunity. And then it'll just happen fast. You'll think, how did this happen so quickly? How did this happen overnight? Overnight, everything's changed. And I know for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, the Lord has spoken to me about many, many, many of his children in this next year are going to almost like overnight come into great financial abundance. I know uh, it's, it's just going to... I just know that. I, I know it prophetically. Um, so get ready, though, to handle that properly. It has to be for the Lord. It has to be in holiness. It can't be a love for the world or a love for money or whatever because he's got kingdom purposes that he wants to entrust us with. And I'll share a little bit more about that tomorrow as well. But um, anyways, um, if you feel like a witness in your spirit and you want God to dispatch angels that will help you get to where he wants you to go quickly he is the creator of time and he can transcend it anytime he wants because he he lives beyond the realm of time he's eternal and i just feel like we're going to see eternal purposes manifest within the realm of time like instantaneously and so get ready it's it's just i, I really feel it so if you would like um that and you want you know some angelic help for it i'm just going to ask the lord to release it. And Bob Jones told me one time, he's, when, when I told him about Swift, actually, he says, yep, you got that angel for life. He said, when God uh, uh, assigns an angel, you have them for life. And I said, really? Where does that say that in the Bible? And he says, well, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. When he gifts you and, you know, with, with an, an angel or calls one to serve you, it's, it doesn't take it back. I thought, I'll take that. I'll, I'll, I'll receive that. Amen. So I really actually believe that. I really, really believe that faith entered me that day. So um, stand to your feet if you want me to pray um, and just receive this and get ready. I just feel like the Lord's saying, really get ready. May there be a spirit of readiness on the inside, alignment to his purposes. You know, we can't, we can't partner in our soul with the world or the demonic realm. We have to partner with God, with God. And so, Father, I just thank you for what you're about ready to do. I see swiftness, Lord God, everywhere. I see acceleration everywhere. I see open doors of opportunity. I see downloads coming from heaven. I see your people moving into their destiny so quickly that even things that they've prayed for for years, things that they've seen years ago prophetically, but they haven't seen the fullness of it yet as far as where they're walking. In the name of Jesus Christ, I call forth the acceleration and the instantaneous fulfillments in the days to come, the suddenlies. And I'm asking, Lord, that you would dispatch right now to your people angelic help. And Lord, you, you, reveal to me the power of that angel named Swift. And I'm asking, Lord God, that as I freely received it, that we can freely give. So I loose that angel right now in Jesus' name, according to the prompting that you've given my spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. So just, just receive that and, you know, <laughs> hallelujah. Woo-hoo. Wow. Wow, I just feel like we just stepped into this supernatural zone of acceleration. Yeah, the Lord just told me uh, God is sending nano angels who can get into, you know, the tiny places, even capillaries, and if any parts of the clogged up arteries or any place. And so I asked the Lord, did you create nano angels? And he said, no, I created angels who can change shapes or sizes as I command. Wow. <laughs> Do you want to release a command? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Heavenly Father, I, I know that when the nano angels are needed to get into real tiny places, even microscopic areas, uh, like behind the eyes or... Uh, capillaries and uh, tiny places, Lord, whatever the shape or size that you choose to tell the angels to become, they will. And uh, they are breakthrough angels, and they are healing angels, 
and the healing and in, in the uh, healing in her wings, yeah. the uh, coming to the in this room right now, yeah. and this afternoon and evening too. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are in charge for whatever the form of the functions that you assign to, they will do. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, well, you go out and browse around the book table and go get your lunch tickets and we'll be uh, serving at 1230. And so uh, you can line up in front of the uh, cafeteria there and um, uh, they'll open the doors at 1230.